next, um, the Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Macdonald, which is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I now call uh, Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much. And I think one of the great truisms of, uh, of government as well as business is a failure to plan is a plan to fail. And that is exactly what the Albanese government has delivered for Australians. The Albanese Labor government promised Australian households it would reduce electricity prices by $275, not once, not twice, but 97 times. Not only has the government broken this promise, broken its trust with Australians, but electricity prices are continuing to spiral out of control. It is not just in the home where we're seeing recent increases of around $500, but now small businesses are also being hit with these terrific uncapped costs. And businesses tell me, as they would be telling other members of this government, that they don't have a choice whether or not to pay rent, to pay electricity, to pay the insurance. So what do they have to do? They have to co cut wages costs. They have to cut the things that they can manage, and that is bad for their business. Uh, this is an extraordinarily uh, bad business government, and it threatens the 30 per cent of people employed around this nation employed in small business. Uh, I have been told that one in ten Australians are already unable to pay their electricity bills, and it's going to get worse because this is a dangerous pathway. It's dangerous for households, it's dangerous for business, and it's dangerous for all Australians given that we live in a nation of extraordinary resources. One of our great growth periods was when we tapped into our terrific uh, coal and gas resources to have affordable, in fact cheap, electricity. It allowed us to invest in manufacturing, uh, into uh, agricultural production, uh, into mining. and This is something that Labor fails to understand. And In my recent two and a half weeks in Western Australia, I saw project after project that has been crippled by the lack of energy supply, whether they be trying to hook up renewable projects uh, to, to transmission lines that don't exist, whether they be trying to negotiate the, the connection of new power sources, they are paying tens of millions of dollars in money that, sh that should be going to more employment in their business, to, should be going to more contractors, more small businesses for their local buy content. And instead, it is being wasted on trying to secure what should be our greatest resource, affordable electricity, because there is no plan. There is no plan under Labor to transition to renewable energy, not in a way that is in any way affordable for Australians. And I can see those on the other side laughing. Well, they're not paying the bills that mean that people are choosing whether or not to go ahead with their business whether or not to keep people employed. Uh, and Blackout Bowen, the, the minister from the other house, must be the most incompetent minister of his generation because his failure, his failure to, to manage the energy system, his failure for Australians to continue supplying the very affordable, reliable electricity that we were able to enjoy means that Labor's energy plan is shutting down Australia's baseload power faster than it can be replaced, increasing the risk of blackouts as soon as this summer. And you know what that means? Households, businesses are buying generators and filling them up with diesel in order to ensure that they have uh, the basics that we expect for our lives, to be able to keep the fridge on, to be able to keep your food. Uh, food safe, to be able to keep an, an air, air conditioner on in a home, or if you have medical conditions, to be able to supply to keep yourself plugged in. This is 
This is an extraordinary situation from a government who should be taking responsibility for Australians, and instead this grand rhetoric, this renewable energy projects, uh, has instead been stalled. And Australians are angry, and they are rightly so, because they are being sold out by this Labor government, sold out when there is no need for it. Senator Macdonald, just before we go to Senator Green, can I ask you to move the motion? I'm so sorry. I move this motion, please. Thank you. Senator Green. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and I'm always very pleased to stand in the Senate and talk about energy and talk about our policies as a government, because only an Albanese Labor government is implementing overdue policy reform to deliver cheaper, cleaner, more reliable energy to our system. And it is difficult to take a motion serious from uh, a party that led a decade of denial, a decade of delay and a decade of leadership spills based purely on an ideological view that they couldn't settle an energy policy. They had 22 energy policies, three leadership spills, I mean four if you count the nationals if you want to throw them in too, all, all because they couldn't agree on what we needed to do to fix our energy market. And now they want to come in here and talk to Australians about affordable and reliable energy when we know for over a decade they failed to do what was required. While the former government put their head in the sand and ignored repeated calls to bring on new supply and transmission, we are acting to ensure Australia's energy grid is fit for purpose for the 21st century. And when it comes to power bills, we took urgent action to shield Australian families and businesses from the worst of global energy price spikes. Our energy bill relief rebates were targeted to more than five million households and more, doing more um, of the toughest and will provide additional hundreds of dollars off bills for everyday Australians. That is energy price bill rebate relief that those opposite voted against. They voted in this chamber for higher energy prices for Australians doing it tough. And they want to come in here and now, and now um, pretend that they care about those very Australians and the energy bills that they are receiving. But I'm glad that we've had an opportunity to talk about EMO's report, which was released last week, the 2023 Electricity Statement of Opportunities, because the report was clear, despite uh, the misinformation you might hear today from those opposite, about the Albanese government's plan to turbocharge renewables is even more critical than, than ever, following a decade of coalition energy inaction and neglect. The report clearly outlines that the federal and state government policies, including rewiring the nation and the capacity investment scheme, are more important than ever, more important than ever to increase supply and reduce the risk of shortfalls across the country. This is an important report, and it's one that our government is taking seriously. And it just begs the question, I thought, Surely this isn't the first time we've seen a report like this published by the energy market regulator, and it's not. Because in 2017, the same report was published, and it said that it confirmed the need for additional investments and new approaches to ensure AEMO has a reliable portfolio of dispatchable energy. In 2017, they said that, but did the Liberal National Party do anything? Well, I think they were preparing to spill another leadership, but they didn't do anything to make sure that we had dispatchable power. In 2018, the same report was released with the same request for more reliable um, energy, and those opposite did nothing in government. In 2019, the same report said a continued elevated risk of expected unserved energy over the next 10 years, as well as forecast tight electricity supply demands conditions in several states for the upcoming summer in 2019 and those in government those in government did nothing in response to that report well the same report in 2020 called for the same risk to be managed and in 2021 the same report said the NEM will need more generation storage and transmission than is currently operating and what did those opposite do well they rolled Michael McCormack when uh, Malcolm Turnbull, uh, sorry, when Scott Morrison uh, was looking likely of committing to net zero. That's how those opposite have approached these reports. 
our government is approaching this report in a completely different way, by making sure that when it comes to affordable and reliable energy, our government has the policies and is making the investment to fix the mess left by a decade of division and denial from those opposite. When it comes to reducing energy bills, those opposite are pursuing the most expensive form of power when it comes to nuclear that will take the longest to build. The longest to build. How's that Collinsville power station going, uh, Senator Hughes? Have we built the Collinsville power station yet, Senator Canavan? We took action to provide bill relief when we were given the chance, but those opposite voted against it. Uh, Senator Hanson has the call. Yeah. Senator Sen Hanson. Yes. Yep. I have on the list. Yep. That's right. I'm giving you the call. call. Thank you. Okay. The government's plan is to close every coal-fired power station in Australia and replace the dispatchal power they provide with electricity generated by a combination of solar wind and stored green hydrogen. What could go wrong? Well, let's look at South Australia, where the plan is most advanced, so they think. Electricity prices in the state are the highest in Australia and are increasing at a faster rate than anywhere else in the country. Much of South Australia's energy comes from wind and solar, but in the second quarter of 2023, this required backup from gas 36 per cent of the time. In short, almost two million people in South Australia would have been subject to rolling blackouts without natural gas. South Australia's current, current energy situation represents the future every other state is moving towards in what can only be called an economic suicide pact. If not coal, gas is essential to back up solar and wind-generated electricity, but despite having some of the largest reserves of gas in the world, it's in very short supply in, in Australia. We keep exporting too much of it, and foreigners pay far less for Australian gas than we do. My bill to create a domestic gas reserve, which I have introduced today, would guarantee supply and lower prices. I now want to return to the government's plan to replace gas with green hydrogen is a plan that exists on a paper napkin, pie-in-the-sky stuff, and we've been all been given um, there before, namely with the NDIS. There is no business plan for any part of the hydrogen idea, including restarting the national electricity grid following a major blackout. How do I know that? In September 2016, the first statewide blackout happened in South Australia. The state could not restart its own grid because there was no power to pressurise the gas into a turbine. The power came from an old coal-fired power station in Victoria, one of the few still operating and not being blown up yet. When all the coal-fired power stations are closed, that will, um, what will we do to restart the grid? The government says Snowy 2 will come to the rescue, but personally I would recommend all households keep a supply of candles. The project has come to a complete standstill, with no tunnelling machine, with the tunnelling machine stuck for more than a year or, or no resolution in sight. This project is facing a blowout, now estimated at $12 billion, thanks to poor policy and business planning. Before I finish, I want to talk about the plan for green hydrogen to replace natural gas. Again, no business plans are available. This year, the government announced $2 billion for the National Hydrogen Strategy without a business plan or any modelling. This was either brave or stupid, but the only beneficiary of the government's um, subsidy will be billionaire and Andrew Forrest. Oh, yes, is he a yes campaigner? Yeah. Because unless you can produce hydrogen for less than $2 a kilogram, it will never stack up economically. Labor in South Australia has committed more than $600 million on a green hydrogen plant at Wyala, again without a business case. What could go wrong? The same as what happened to the state in 2016. Australians need to wake up to green energy fantasies invented by emotionally driven climate change activists and brainwashed children through our educational system to say the world's coming to an end that are not even remotely based on evidence or science, but for the vote and financial gains. These are pipe dreams driven by green fear-mongering. They sound wonderful. They sound too good to be true. That's because they're not true. 
And the ones who will end up paying for it all with more taxes and record high energy prices will be the Australian people. Looks like we'll have to give up those creamy barista coffees and go back to opening tins of grandma's international roast. We'll have to sacrifice a great deal more on the altar of the climate change cult because the, the people of Australia are fed up with the right pain, the rising costs in electricity. And it just irks me on to hear the Labor Party blame the coalition for the escalating prices in electricity when you keep putting these, these power lines, what, 28,000 kilometres of power lines across the country against the will of the people of this nation because you're pushing your own agenda that doesn't stack up. The people will understand your electric cars won't stack up because we don't have the minerals in this nation to uh, more than one generation to build electric cars. So you're going to control the people in this nation. So, sorry, I've got seven seconds to go. The fact is, you are destroying this nation with the Greens and the Labor Party. You are destroying the people of this thank nation. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Hughes. Oh, the, the anticipation. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I am a bit disappointed, though, I'm following Senator Hanson because had I followed on from Senator Green, I was fired up because the, uh, the amount of rubbish that we hear coming from the other side. But then I hear sense coming from Senator Hanson's uh, up at the far end of the chamber, and I, I start to breathe again. But of course, I would like to uh, thank Senator Hanson for getting me worked up again when she mentioned we may not be able to get a coffee anymore, but back to international roast. Oh, I can tell you, that's not happening. Not happening. Nothing wrong with international roast. Oh, Senator McGrath. I mean, I know we love a Cheerio and a little cube cheese, but the one's got to draw the line somewhere. But I mean, to hear. Senator Green come here and talk about the plans that they had and all those wonderful things they were going to del deliver through energy. And they were going to deliver, if you noticed, anyone playing along at home, hundreds of dollars of savings off the bill. Well, I thought I'd remind Senator Green it was $297. That's how much you were going to deliver coming off everybody's power bills. Unfortunately, it hasn't quite happened that way. And in fact, if you talk to any Australian out there, and we actually do on this side speak to real Australians, and particularly Australians who run small businesses that employ people, there isn't a person whose power bills have not gone up. And I hear, you know, that these businesses are facing increasing power bills, but those uh, Australian households are all facing increasing power bills of significantly more than $297 per year. So that at no point are we ever, ever going to see those bills come down? Because we know, and we're here today, and thank you to Senator MacDonald for her um, motion this afternoon, this evening, but we're here to look at the AMO report, and the AMO report is very, very interesting. But what's interesting even more so about it is when you line it up next to the Gen Costs report that this government now relies on so heavily. Now, we have Minister Bowen. Uh, blackout Bowen, as he potentially should be known, Minister Bowen in the other place, uh, whose nickname I heard on 2GB the other day was Casanova. And I sort of had to think about it. It's because of everything uh, he touches. Senator Brown? I ask that um, Senator Hughes um, withdraw that uh, reflection on Minister yep. Bowen, and she knows quite well that she needs to. Um, refer to people in the other place by their appropriate titles. Yes, I, I will remind you, Senator Hughes, that I know you were quoting from the radio, but that's also inappropriate. So if you withdraw the comment without reference to it, thank you. Uh, I will withdraw, but I, I mean, it's some guidance because I'm repeating what a nickname is, uh, and I'm happy Senator to refer Hughes. to him as Mr. Bowen. But uh, am I allowed to say what his nickname is, Senator or are we not Hughes? allowed to reference it? Uh, please resume, your, uh, Senator Brown. I'm in control of the Senate. Order, order. Order across the chamber. Excuse me, Senator Hughes. When I explained to you and I asked you to withdraw, I also explained to you that it went to references used in other places, i.e. on the radio. So I will ask you to um, withdraw the comment without making any reference to it. I withdraw. So, for Minister Bowen, who, uh, if you listen to Ben Fordham on Radio 2GB, has a particular name for him, and it's really quite funny. In fact, I believe it's Ray Hadley who has the name for him, which is particularly funny. Uh, I will guide you there, since apparently I'm not allowed to reference anything said uh, anywhere. 
Uh, but Minister Bowen, I have noticed, so he's building an industry. Uh, we noticed that he said he was going to build solar, uh, needed solar panels and needed wind. He needed 22,000 solar panels to be built every year, uh, every day. I'm sorry, my mistake. Every day, 22,000 solar panels and 40 wind turbines every month. Uh, when asked at estimates that. Uh, the beginning of this year, that it was 140, 81 days since he'd made those claims. The department couldn't tell us how, that, how many they had produced, only to acknowledge they were well behind schedule. We now know that uh, there need to be up to somewhere like uh, 800, 8 million a year. They need to have put in about 300,000 by now. Uh, we know that, that no stage has that been reached. But the industry that Ms Bowen is building and I think it's one that anyone who's a bit of an online investor, share trader, maybe have a look. Uh, I bought some the other day and I'll be making sure I put them in the cupboard and probably looking to buy a few more. Uh, the candle industry, because I think we're reasonably sure as summer approaches, particularly since Queensland already is having a pretty hot day, I think we might need a few candles because as the blackouts roll out, uh, and as, as Senator Hanson just frightened us all that there'll be no coffee machine going and we'll be all on to international roast, uh, there'll be no Netflix. Won't be at home on your iPad, having it charged up with your with your Wi-Fi working. No, you'll be sitting by a candle. It'll be a romantic candlelight evening on a hot summer's night because the power's gone out because the wind ain't blowing and the sun ain't shining, and that the coal mining industry and the coal energy industry has been demonised. The gas industry, the demonisation of those opposite of the gas industry, unbelievable. And I, to hear Senator Green go on, though, here's a little reminder for you all that sit opposite. You're the government. You can say whatever you like about what happened eight, nine, ten years ago. Well done. Well done, people. We can all do Rudd Gillard Rudd too. We were all there at that time as well. But let me tell you, they are not. Yeah, listen, Senator Coney, you interject there, and all interjections, I may remind you, are disorderly. But. Uh, the, you know, they're all disorderly, Senator Ciccone, but they won't be blaming Tony Abbott when it's 42 degrees and the aircon's not working because the wind and solar aren't working, Senator Ciccone. They'll be blaming Mr Albanese you, and Minister Bowen. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Rennick. Mr Deputy President, and it pains me, it pains me greatly to have to rise to speak uh, to this motion today. Because to think that Australia is now paying for some of the most expensive energy in the world is a complete and utter tragedy. It is a complete and utter tragedy. And it is the combination of decades of mismanagement of our energy system uh, and no doubt you know, by none other than AEMO themselves, because we have this half-breed uh, Frankenstein set up of an energy market in this country, where we have the federal government, the state government and the private sector all responsible for electricity. And of course, if anyone that works in the private sector knows, when everyone is in charge, nobody's in charge. So, you know, if we want to actually fix this, we should go back to the origins of our constitution and actually put the states back in charge of energy. And the reason why I'm very passionate about that is when I grew up in the great state of Queensland, Queensland had some of the cheapest energy in the world, and that was under the great leadership by Sir Joe Bjorke Peterson. And I know that some of you go, "Oh, yeah, but what about the brown paper bags?" Well, let me tell you, the black tape, the green tape, and the red tape is just a legitimised form of corruption in this country, and it's out of control. It's out of control. And we got the cheapest energy because we opened up coal mines. We used our natural resources, and yet here. Today, we refuse to use our natural resources. We would rather import renewables from foreign countries than actually use our own energy here in this country. And I've referred to this many times before in, in this chamber. Near my hometown at Chinchilla, the Cogan Creek Power Station, is 400 million tonnes of coal. That is right there, just below the surface, and the only cost of it is actually getting it out of the ground and transporting it about one to two kilometres to the actual power station. There's also another pad there where you could build another turbine to actually power Queensland forward. But do we do that? No. And I'd like to commend the media statement put out by the member for Fairfax, where he called on the Labor government to scrap its ideological approach to energy. And I can't agree with that more, because it is this ideological approach that somehow CO2 is going to globe, you know, cause global boiling 
that is at the heart of this problem. It is at the heart of this problem. And for the last three decades or four decades, we have been living in the Middle Ages, where knowledge has been completely thrown out the door and, repla and replaced by fear and fear-mongering and superstition. Now, the reason why we live in such a great world, a country here and across the world with such a high standard of living is because of the Enlightenment, when scientists actually went and put down and defined the laws of science. And one of those, and those laws of science demonstrated cause and effect, and they quantified cause and effect. And if we're going to put this climate change rubbish to bed, we know, need to go back to basics. We need to sort out our education system, and we need to start teaching maths and science again. Because of this whole so-called crisis can easily be quantified because CO2 is a gas. And is there a law but for the relationship between gas and temperature? Yes, there is. It's called the ideal gas law. It's called PV equals NRT, pressure times volume equals the number of moles by the ideal gas constant by the temperature. Now, what I want to know is why no one has ever discussed this before. And it's very easy if you actually use that algorithm. If carbon dioxide increases by 100 parts per million, that is one in 10,000 increase. So all you've got to do is go one in 10,000 by the current temperature of the Earth, which is 287 degrees Kelvin, and you get a rise of 0.0287 degrees. And all you have to then do is take the specific density of carbon, uh, which is carbon dioxide, sorry, which is 1.53, times that by 2.87, and you will get a formula. For every 100 parts per million increase in carbon dioxide, you will increase the temperature of the Earth by 0.043 degrees. Now, I ask you, Given that, the temperature, the, given that the carbon dioxide has increased by 140 parts per million, or about 0.06 degrees in the last 140 years, uh, is that a small price to pay? I think that is a price worth paying to have brought billions and billions of people out of the dark ages and into the world we live in today. Because if we're going to stop this rubbish and go back to baseload energy, we need to kill the myth that somehow climate change is going to cause global boiling and bring the world to an end. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Canavan. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, the chickens are coming home to roost. There is no doubt about that. Uh, uh, we have madly uh, persisted on uh, seeking to turn our energy system to one that is almost completely reliant on the weather over the past decade or so. And, and we're now left with the absurd situation where uh, Labor state governments over the past week, two Labor state governments in our biggest states, have announced that they'll subsidise coal-fired power stations. Uh, that's, that's the farce that uh, our energy system has descended into, uh, that after a decade or so of saying we don't need coal-fired power anymore, we've got this wind and the sun is free and uh, it's all going to be rainbows and unicorns, uh, we now have a situation where we're having to subsidise old, inefficient uh, coal-fired power stations in both New South Wales. Uh, and Victoria, just to keep the lights on. Uh, what, is, what is absolutely and abundantly clear now is that the path we're on is a path to ruination as a nation. Uh, the path we are on is a path to higher power bills. The path we are on is a path to losing our jobs, losing our manufacturing industries to other nations who are not as silly as us. Uh, we, have, we have been installing solar and wind energy at a rate four times higher per person than North America and Europe. So I often hear from the other side that the former government didn't invest enough in, in solar and wind or in renewable power. Well, how much is enough? Uh, we, we, we're running at a rate four times higher than Europe and, and North America. No country is going further faster down this route than Australia, and the results are all around us for, to see. Because the other thing I often hear from, from government senators and, and members in the other place is that that the former government failed because four gigawatts of baseload power came out of the system over that decade or so, and only one gigawatt uh, was installed to replace it. And that's true. That is a fair criticism of energy policy over the past 10 or so years, that a lack of planning, a lack of foresight has led to the fact that we have only or almost exclusively relied on power, power options that we can't rely on all the time. They're not baseload power. Solar and wind certainly are not. Uh, uh, some other uh, forms of power gas peaking plants are, are, are not. 
Uh, we have shut down our power stations that can run 24 hours a day, uh, and we're left with things that only run some of the time. Our solar and wind uh, uh, um, uh, power is, is ba uh, they're basically the dull bludgers of the energy system. They only turn up to work when they want to. Uh, they're not there all the time for us. Uh, whereas our base load coal fired power station, our hydro, generally speaking, as long as it's uh, enough rain, uh, is there for us uh, whenever we need it. So we need to desperately fix that three gigawatt gap. It's actually grown further since the new government was elected. We just shut down the Liddell coal fired power station. That's another. Uh, well, it was originally 1,600 megawatts, 1,200 megawatts when it's shut. So, so the gap now is, is something like four to four and a half gigawatts of power that we're down compared to a decade or so ago. Where are we filling that gap from? Well, nothing the government's doing right now is, is filling that gap. So for all their rhetoric about how terrible the former government was in taking out baseload power, they're doing absolutely nothing to fix that very same gap that they identify in their rhetoric. There's no, there, are, there are no baseload projects, baseload power projects that the government is backing right now. There's a gas peaking plant in Newcastle. Who knows what's happening to that? They're not very happy with that. They seem to be going on the go slow with that. That's not baseload. There's a snowy hydro scheme which is mid in cost blowouts and who knows, may never happen, certainly we're probably not going to see it this decade. So where is the solution? And the Australian people are sick and tired of the politics that are being played on this issue. They're paying for it in their higher power bills. And I'm, I'm standing here saying the coalition government didn't get it all right. But certainly the Labor government is not doing anything to fix it. And it's time for us to get real and fix it. And that means investing. Very simple. There's a simple response here. We need to build power stations that are on all the time. And that is coal, that is gas, that could be nuclear in the future as well. But let's get on with building them now because I was told, I've been saying this for a long time, I've been saying for a long, long time. And I was told when I first started really campaigning for this in about 2016 that it would take too long to build a coal fired power station, Matt. Uh, it's going to take us five or six years. Well, it's been longer than that since I've been saying this. And the responses we did come up with, like Snowy Hydro, are still possibly a decade away. Let's get on. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, no doubt about that. But the second best time is today. And we should get on with stopping, stop the politics, stop the rot, stop the excuses, and actually build things that work, that we know can save our jobs, that we know can keep our lights on, and most importantly of all, we know can get down power bills so Australian families uh, can, can actually manage their budgets. I'll put the question. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Macdonald be agreed to. Those of the question say aye. Against, no. no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Then there's Shoe Bridge. Um, the intern can't stay there. The intern, I, I don't know who he came in with, but I'm sorry he can't stay there. A and just go out and come in. Yeah. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Macdonald be agreed to. That I shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the eyes and Senator Giacconi as teller for the nose. Order. There being 23 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative.